Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. This is uh, C.R. Wiley, and I'm joined by uh, some friends today, that, uh, two of whom uh, I'm with each time, but we've got a special guest today, and we'll let him introduce himself in a moment. But to just give you a little bit of background on me, I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest. I've been a professor of philosophy. I've written books, and I've also been in the building trades and been a, 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 an investor in real estate. So anyway, that's enough about me. Why don't we go to you, Tom? I am Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, uh, Christian ethics, and philosophy. Uh, one of the places is Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. All right. Great. And now you, Glenn? I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired and recovering history professor <laughs> from Central Connecticut State University. I'm a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview and a ministry associate with Reflections Ministries. Great. Well, we have a guest with us today. Uh, Mark, it's great to have you here. Uh, maybe what you could do is just give us a little bit of uh, background on yourself and uh, you know your affiliations, et cetera, and and then we'll get into the subject of the day, which is a which is a new book you've got out, and we're looking forward to talking to you about it. But go ahead and uh, tell us, uh, tell folks out there in podcast land who you are. Well, I'm I'm officially now I'm I'm emeritus professor at Emory University in English. I retired. I took a very early retirement uh, last year. And I've been an editor at First Things magazine since 2014. I run a podcast there twice a week, focused on books. You've been on with, with a great show. And yeah. I, uh, I write a lot of stuff now in, in First Things and other periodicals. I've had a lot of books, uh, academic books that I did when I started at Emory University in 1989. But for, for our show, I started writing more sort of broader cultural things. After I spent a few years at the National Endowment for the Arts in 2003 to 2005, I was running the research programs at, at the Arts Endowment. And one of the big projects that we did there was based upon a, a survey that the Arts Endowment does uh, with the Census Bureau every few years on public participation in the arts. How often people go to the ballet, uh, listen to classical and jazz music and, and the like, go to museums. And one of the questions we asked on the 2002 version of the survey was how often people read literature, uh, fiction, poetry, drama, and how often they just read books in general. And when we got the results of that, we were a little shocked to find that book reading and literary reading among the younger cohort, 18 20 to 24 year olds, had fallen off the cliff in the yeah. preceding 10 years and then 20 years before that. And we made a report out of this called Reading at Risk, uh, which got a lot of circulation. It was a topic that year in 2004 uh, when it came out. And I sort of, the, the chairman asked me to go on a tour around the country giving talks about this sorry decline in such a long standing, crucial activity for everyone uh, growing up in, a, in an open society. Right. And out of that book, I, I out of that report, I should say, I took a lot of the research. I added a lot more and did this book in 2008 called, with, with this title, derived from Philip Roth, the novelist, The Dumbest Generation. <laughs> and the, the, the full title was How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future or Don't Trust Anyone Under 30. And that, <laughs> the, the timing was right for that book. I got lucky with it in that there was all this cheerleading for millennials at that time and for Web 2.0. Web 2.0 was the digital sphere in which people were able to be more participatory. They didn't have to be passive viewers like couch potatoes watching TV. They could talk back. They could do product reviews as on Amazon. Social media, suddenly you could engage. You could form communities out there. You could go to Facebook and fashion your identity and, and send it out. So it was much more interactive medium. And the millennials, the teenagers at the time, were said to be the ones leading the way. They were the digital natives, the early adopters. And they had these handhelds and they were jumping on Facebook and then Twitter a few years later. Uh, and then the iPhones were coming out and they were texting three, 4,000 texts every month doing the phone calls, the chatting, and then the gaming, of course. And I think that 
suddenly there was a realization, this may be very bad for right. the formation of young people. And I, I and a few others, we, we sort of were, were, were able to get ahead of that I, not because I'm particularly smart or anything, but I was an English teacher. Books were so important to me. And then when I go out on the quad at Emory University in 2007 and find all these kids walking between, you know, the, the buildings like this, da, 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 with this consternation on their faces, not joy, I thought, this, this is really bad. <laughs> I go into the library and every computer station is occupied. I go up the stacks and it's like a morgue. And I thought they're making libraries into information centers. Remember when they when they did that and that letting kids live in this screen saturated world, it's going to do bad things to their heads and it's not going to give them the tools when they hit adulthood, the tools of being able to sit down and read the Sermon on the Mount slowly, thoughtfully. They haven't watched uh, great plays, you know, Death of a Salesman. They haven't watched great movies. They don't grow. They didn't grow up with those anymore. They were in the video games. They didn't listen. They didn't get classical music in pop culture the way I did in cartoons and in TV shows uh, and in special <laughs> events at the White House. <laughs> you know, they didn't have rap. JFK didn't have rappers at the White House. Right. He had Pablo Casals. So uh, they, right. they weren't getting religion. They weren't getting patriotism. They weren't getting high culture, tradition. They weren't getting stable family traditions, family lineages, and strong neighborhood, right. you know, uh, uh, backgrounds, sort of, sort of, you know, tradition in, in neighborhoods. And now I, I thought, okay, it's time for an update. In 2022, yeah. the, the digital natives, those fantastic, amazing millennials, they're now 33 <laughs> years old. How are they doing? Yeah, Not so yeah. good. Uh, yeah, you know, there's yeah. a sour mood, uh, you know, depression. You, you've, you've seen the reports, depression and anxiety. And this was before the pandemic. It's really gotten worse uh, with yeah. the pandemic. And the problem is they are facing the ordinary failures and disappointments that we all face. We don't always get the perfect job. We don't get into the first choice business school. The, the, that girl, she dumped me, you know, and <laughs> I'm, I'm devastated. These things happen. And, you know, when they were young, the promise was, I can have a fantastic life. I'm going to follow my passions and I've got this internet here that lets me fabricate the world I want to live in. Now, why can't I do that now that I'm 33? Mm -hmm. why, why can't I keep living as if I'm in an episode right. of Friends <laughs> from the 90s, you know, all the way through my 30s? <laughs> yeah. And they don't understand, again, because they don't, they didn't get the materials that would teach them that tragic wisdom of life in a fallen world, the, the sad realities of, of suffering and dying. And now they don't know where to go with those experiences because they haven't read the Psalms. Right, right. They don't know the fate of, they don't know the fate of, of, of Moses right. being out so, in the wilderness. They, they, yeah. they just, you know, yeah. where are, you know what? Stuff happens <laughs> as far as their understanding. Right, right. You know, one of the things that a person might erroneously conclude by looking at the titles of these books is that you just don't like millennials. But I, I think that the, the thing that you're getting at is how we failed them. There's something uh, to the fact that, that so, somewhere along the way, uh, the, the authorities in their lives, particularly in the world of education, just uh, just kind of said, uh, you don't need us anymore. We're just going to stand on the sideline and cheer as you do all the things that you feel like you want to do. You had, in the first chapter of the, of, the, of your uh, this new book, uh, Making Unhappy 
and dangerous adults who talked about Macruza and a lecture that he gave. Now, here's a guy that could be, I don't think there's anybody that uh, we could identify as more radically leftist than Marcuse, and yet he had zero tolerance in 1969 for stupidity. Can you can you give us a little uh, sort of synopsis of what occurred? Marcuse was the great guru of the radical left. He was a Marxist with a, a little Freudian flavor added, and he was a brilliant man, very educated, part of what was called the Frankfurt School, a group of very talented, brilliant scholars who emigrated to, several of them emigrated to the United States. Marcuse was one of them. He ended up in California, of course. And what uh, what happened at the campus of SUNY Westbury was he was invited. And it was this kind of experimental campus in total 60s norms where, uh, you know, you show up to class, you know, barefoot, that's cool. <laughs> uh, kids serve on committees. Yeah, of course. We're totally egalitarian here. Yeah. And if a kid wanted, this is one example, if a kid wanted to do a senior thesis where he stacked, you know, I don't know, matches across Brooklyn Bridge, that'll serve. We'll, we'll approve <laughs> that project. So uh, Marcuse is invited in by Michael Novak, who was a, a, a prominent Catholic journalist and, and writer at the time who ended up becoming, becoming a neocon, but he was a liberal at this time. He invites Marcuse at a campus because what could be better for all the student <laughs> radicals? There it's the war is the Vietnam War is going on and all these experiments in living are being conducted uh, from the college campus outward. He comes to campus and he hears all this radical talk from, from the kids. And one of the themes is that the past has nothing to teach us. We're new. We're going to fix things. They were wrong. We are revolutionaries. And they really had the idea of the revolutionary. Today is year zero. The past yeah. is something that we need to eliminate in order to rebuild a better future. And Marcuse listened to this. And in the presentation, he said, what is wrong with you? You can't do this. You've got to study the great minds in philosophy, economics, history, literature. You, you have to understand this tradition out of which you really build your revolutionary understanding. I mean, his attitude was, you know, the, the system, capital S, the establishment, capital E, likes nothing better than a dim-witted revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> because they're, they're just going it, to, it's all just going to end up being theater. Yeah. And capitalism likes theater. You know, the, the film Woodstock, that made millions and millions <laughs> yeah. of dollars. Wait a minute. That, yeah. That's contrary to, to the spirit of Woodstock. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, it, it, uh, it could be consumed. It was made into a commodity. Yeah. That's yeah. an example where Mark Husa would say, this is capitalism's capacity to absorb resistance to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're going to get absorbed if you don't read. If you yeah. don't read your Rousseau, if you don't understand the French Revolution, and he rebuked them, said, basically, shut up, go read some <laughs> books. Then maybe <laughs> after a few years, you might have something interesting to say. Of course, they hated him for that. They, they said, you know, you sound like my square father, man. <laughs> uh, and so, but, but this was this was the point of the, I, I wanted to pick a, you know, a, a perfect leftist, not a conservative, to okay. make this argument about the necessity of becoming educated in your young. And I end the book with Malcolm X right. saying the exact same thing. I wanted right. to bookend this yeah. Yeah. with two idols of, right. of the left. Of course, Malcolm X was a radical social religious conservative. In many, oh, yeah. many, many ways. In many ways. Uh, he, Malcolm X would despise the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. He would despise yeah. it. And I mean, I, I, I have no truck with Malcolm X's religion. Right. But in terms of a lot of his social norms and his behavioral yeah. manners, yeah. Uh, he, he comes out of prison after being a rotten thug, a yeah. violent, abusive, 
exploitative thief goes into prison with a working vocabulary of 200 words, as he put it. They called him Satan hmm. when he got in after the first few months, and he liked that nickname. Yeah, yeah. But he, he actually comes out a transformed individual. He talks about it as a conversion experience all the way, and it was by reading. Yeah. Well, I, I won't go into the details, but reading, reading, reading. He said, I never, ever wanted to be without a book. This is after he's out of prison, he's famous, he's yeah. traveling. I always had a book yeah. with me. I said, hey, millennials, if Malcolm Little, this horrible person, can change in this way, you can too. Mm -hmm. Okay, You're only reading six or seven minutes a day, you 35-year-old, know nothing. <laughs> yeah. You can know something. You can do this. And, and you, you, you said... I'm, I'm trashing the millennials. You know, one chapter in the first book is the betrayal of the mentors. Mm -hmm. And the first sentence of this book is, what have we done to them? All right. The mentors, my generation's teachers, didn't impress upon the millennials when they were young. Come on. You've got to shut that screen down. And you've got to go see what Macbeth says when he hears about the death of his wife. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand St. Paul persecuted Christians, and he has to live with that knowledge of, of how he helped kill Stephen. Mm -hmm. He has to carry that with him right. for the rest of his life. You've got to understand these things. And this is actually going to make you a more solid person, who feels like he has a more meaningful life. So what do you think is behind the loss of confidence with, with regard to authorities, particularly in the academy? Uh, actually, before we get there, I'd yeah. like to just sort of jump in. Yeah. I, um, I had one of my colleagues' daughters in one of my freshman intro classes. And I assigned some books, and there was one day in particular that I remember, I was asking them questions about the chapters that they'd read, and they couldn't answer any of them. I got upset and uh, basically said, okay, we're starting to have quizzes. I had nothing else planned for today. It was going to be a discussion of the chapter. We're done. And I walked out. My colleague came to me a day or two later and he said, yeah, you know, I was talking to my daughter and she told me, you know, the problem with Professor Sunshine is that he expects us to understand what we read. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he said, basically, you've got two choices. You can get upset about the fact that they don't understand it, or you can just work with them where they are. He was, of course, advocating the latter. <laughs> but the very fact that they're in college and they can't answer basic questions about the content of something that I assigned them to read. These weren't trick questions. They weren't complicated. They didn't require outside knowledge. They didn't even require any analysis. I was just saying, what did they say? They couldn't answer. Because, yeah. well, I, I appreciate the push for saying we need to read more, but actually we have to teach them to read. Yeah. I think so that gets us to kind of this crisis, just even kids getting into college who don't deserve to be there or just aren't ready for it. Yeah. Well, and like I said, this was the daughter of a professor. Yeah. Yeah. The turn to quizzes, I actually did myself about 15 years ago. And what I would actually do is something that you would find done in middle school or high school. I would give them the questions that would be on the quiz on, I would give them Monday's quiz questions on Friday. And they were short answer, you know, three or four sentence answers. And then they would have to come in and take the test, but they couldn't bring in any, any notes or anything. So they had to answer the questions and then sort of remember, retain, memorize their answers to those questions. Now, you, it sounds like, well, this is an exercise for lower education. I said, yeah, it is but they didn't get that in their lower education. So they're going to get it now. And in a way that is meeting them where they are, but making them, you know, get beyond where they are. And I, I you know, the question of why 
have the educators, at least in the humanities areas, why have they given up? Why do they have no confidence in the value of their materials? I, I see a lot of decadence among yeah. the humanities professors that I don't see among the other professors. I've seen history professors vote to eliminate U.S. history requirements for general education. I have never heard a chemistry professor say, you know, it's really not important whether kids learn any chemistry or not. You know, math, <laughs> I mean, do they, do they really need, yeah. you know, they, they believe in their fields. They believe in the value. And they, and they actually think, chemists think there's something beautiful about the atom. You know, they, they, they love, but mathematicians will talk about how elegant that proof <laughs> happens to be. You can see their devotion to their material. <laughs> right. You know, what, 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 what did I see my colleagues do? You know, they'll say, well, you know, Emerson really was racist. Uh, or, you know, in yeah. Shakespeare, let, let, let's talk about cross-dressing in Shakespeare. That, 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 that's, what we'll, that's what we'll focus on. And, yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, I'm going to say, you know, this is not really the important thing. I mean, one, one of the symptoms of decadence is that you learn, you fail to distinguish between the significant and the indis insignificant. You know, let, let's, let's, let's talk about Madonna videos as just as easily as we can about the films of, of Orson Welles and Sergei Eisenstein. You know, that kind of flattening <laughs> of everything. Right, yeah, right. Uh, right. And, and there was a whole assault on the whole idea of high culture. You know, high culture yeah. in the 90s, this happened. Before that, in the 70s and 80s, there was an assault on the word civilization. We didn't talk about Western civilization anymore. We talked about cultures. We put it in plural, yeah. and it was right. culture, not civilization anymore. And my, my you know, frankly, I, I'm, I'm, I was a liberal through the 90s, very liberal. But when it came to education, and I mean, I was T.S. Eliot and, and Western civilization and high art high culture, masterpieces, great books, that hierarchy of values. I mean, I, I read a while back, T.S. Eliot gave a speech uh, to a group in the Midwest uh, where he talked about the classics. And he actually said, you know, if the classics aren't taught through the lens of Christianity, I say the hell with it. Uh, he, he actually mm -hmm. chided liberal educators for not really believing anything. He actually... He actually praised Marxist, leftist educators. At least they believe in something. They've got a teleology, in fact. They've got, <laughs> they've got a canon. Yeah. Marxist works. Right. You've got to know chapter and verse. You know, conservatives believe in something. Leftists believe in something. Liberals, you know, whatever floats your boat. You know, well, let's just uh, open things up. That was, <laughs> that's the decadence that, that, you know, the confidence. Right. Well, there, there was a push. There was some pushback, as you note, uh, noted. Uh, you know, a person like Edie Hirsch or, or Alan Bloom. You know, there, th those, those people did push back, and there was a kind of flare-up, I suppose you could say, for a little while, um, in terms of the subject. You know, it, it was at least a matter of debate. We were talking about the canon. We were talking about, you know, the American mind, that kind of thing. Uh, and it, and it, and, and these were, you know people who were philosophically liberal. I mean, they were liberals in the classic sense, uh, Democrats uh, voting for, you know, uh, you know, the kinds of changes that they, be they believe that, uh, you know, the federal government could help to, to uh, promote in our society. Uh, but, but those guys, even though they were on the right side of the, the, of the, the, the political aisle from the, in the perspective of many uh, people, they weren't able to get you know much uh, traction. They couldn't get uh, these ideas across. Um, have any thoughts about that? I, I know you talk a little bit about E.D. Hirsch in the book, uh, this latest book. Uh, but any any thoughts on why why they couldn't uh, rally the troops, so to speak, around the very things we've been talking about? Well, E.D. Hirsch's famous book, Cultural Literacy, came out in 1987. And I'm on Hirsch's Core Knowledge Foundation board. So I've worked with him over, over the years on education issues. And the thing is, Don is a lifelong Democrat. He is a liberal Democrat all the way 
but he says, I'm an education conservative. Why? Because education tradition, it's, it's the Marcuse argument, is something that allows people to operate in the world in intelligent, successful ways. When you don't teach great books to African-American kids in urban settings, but those, those upper middle class kids in suburban schools, they're getting them. You are setting those black kids up for failure. They can't compete. They're gonna go into that college classroom. Let's say you got a, you got a bright, bright African-American kid who gets into some college. He's gonna find himself suddenly in a room full of kids who got a different education than him. And it's, he's gonna suffer for that. So Hirsch said, these old fashioned curricula are actually instruments of climbing the income ladder. It, it, they help class mobility, give everyone the tools. The progressives, his argument was the progressives who said, we need more cultural relevance. We need to teach say an Afrocentric curriculum. We need to meet the kids where they are. He said, you know, that's fine in your school, but when they get to the next level, they're not gonna have the tools and they're, they're gonna drop out one year into college, they're, they're gonna be gone. And I mean, I was on a panel once at AEI and with a teacher, award-winning teacher in Maryland. And she said, you know, the students in my school teach, speak several dozen different languages. And one of the things I teach them is that standard English is the master's language. That's the master's language. So that they develop this adversarial consciousness about that language. And I said something along the lines in response of whether standard English is the master's language or not, it's the language of college. And when your kids go to college, for them to have a suspicious, contentious, adversarial relationship to that language is not going to help them write good papers. It's really not. And you don't know this because they hit a wall years after you've seen them. Right. But you're not, you're not helping. You're not helping them. You know, the Ed schools banned Hirsch's book, Hirsch's ideas mm -hmm. from, from the from the classrooms. They, they, they blackballed Hirsch's ideas. They didn't want to hear anything about it. Uh, you know, he'd spent, he'd spent six months at number two on the New York Times bestseller list behind Bloom's Closing the American Mind. Right. <laughs> nope. We don't want that stuff in, right. in, our, in our classrooms. So I think, I think people like Hirsch and Bloom won the debate in the public square. But academia doesn't care what, who wins in the public square because they own the turf. Yeah. They have the jobs. They sit in the offices. They've got control. Right. And, and so, you know, we had, we had in those years a lot of debates about political correctness, you remember. Right. So Dinesh D'Souza and Roger Kimball and others, they won on the news shows. You know, they'd be on PBS NewsHour. Right. They convinced a lot of people how bad political correctness is on campus. That didn't shake the professors and the administrators one single bit. Mm. Political correctness is worse now, much mm. worse yeah. in this woke age than it was 30 years ago. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, even in the, on the graduate level of Christian evangelical seminary, um, especially, I mean, I kind of teach in a, in a, a broader environment. Um, but the woke stuff is incredible. They're well versed in that. They have no clue about classic Christian sources. They wouldn't know who the Cappadocians are. They wouldn't know anything about the debates that have landed their core teachings in the form that they have them. But they already know who's guilty of what in terms of kind of, you know, social advantage. And I was just teaching an ethics class and the assumption, the way they don't even read facts correctly and they the way they can import a feeling or an assumption and think that that qualifies as content substance and argument is incredible and it's increasingly getting worse and these are adults now i mean 
Um, so I'm talking even a, b- a little bit above the the uh, millennial age. Some of them have gone back to school, but they they have gotten from their university training all of the curriculum that has prevented them from reading anything outside of those approved woke um, works. Let, let me ask a big a big question. Do you think the woke message is going to bring more people into Sunday service? <laughs> is, is that going to put more seats in the pews? <laughs> yeah, I. It's such a downer. It's so negative. Yeah, I, and, I, I mean, and, I, and, I, and that's a great that's a great uh, uh, you know rhetorical question that we could see you know. Uh, or we we should uh, present to a lot of people who ostensibly, you know, are interested in reaching people with the gospel, you know, people who are evangelists and so forth, or people who are planting churches. But uh, I wonder if sometimes, um, you know, the the ability to kind of uh, pick up on, the, you know, the just the very reality that this is not something that's going to get you anywhere you want to want to go. Uh, just as lost on people today, and I guess the signals that they're that they're paying attention to kind of get back to the subject of your book, uh, Mark, with regard to social media, it, those kinds of things. So we've, we've created this virtual reality. I mean, it's virtual; it really isn't reality. It's it's out of touch with reality. But but people take their signals from that world. They don't take their signals uh, from just even. Uh, you know, what meets their eyes on a Sunday morning in a, in a particular church or neighborhood. They don't, they're not even a, a kind of attuned to that anymore. You know, the, the screen, the communications on the screen, one is just accelerated responses. Everyone can speak very quickly and send it out and get reaction and counter reaction it, it, it is a reactive environment. And it's so easy to react, especially when the person isn't in the room to whom you are reacting. <laughs> I, I, I would tell students, when you communicate online, pretend that that person is sitting across the table from you. You'll, you'll, you'll behave better if you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I... I said, I was doing a panel at VMI and. Yeah, I, re- I remember you, is this the panel you were talking about in the book? That some of the responses uh, from the panelists at VMI uh, and how they responded to your, your talk? They, they did, I was, I was just the moderator and it was a huge event at VMI. So the whole, the whole campus was there in the big auditorium, the big sports arena, you know, 12, 1500 people. And, uh, I was just the moderator of a panel on social media and all three panelists were big pro social media types. I remember one guy ran a big social media center at Georgetown and he talked about how social media is the greatest driver of charity in our entire country. It is the most amazing driver. We did a survey of that. Okay. Now this is why I'm going to tell you why all three panelists and everyone in the audience hated me <laughs> and and it turned into a circus well with me, people, we, we, people before you jump and hooting yeah. and here's what i said to the georgetown guy and i'm just a moderator said let me ask you a question in your uh survey of forms of charitable giving and social media coming out number one did you include the donations during church services Silence. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what are you talking? In other words, what are you talking <laughs> about? Social yeah, media. Yeah. I mean, do you know how many millions and millions and millions of dollars are given through churches every weekend? What are you talking? You know, I, I look. I, I started the whole event. The, 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 there's a social media uh, editor at the Washington Post who who was there, and she thought she said how great it was. Uh, and and a professor there who was an awful person uh, who, was, who was defending the kids because I got up there after they spoke and I said, I'm just going to moderate the questions that you have. But I'll just tell you where my, I stand. 
Last night, I said to my wife on the phone, honey, when I die, put on my headstone, he never took a selfie. <laughs> and at that moment, it was, it, it was, it, it, it just, I got every question. The kids, they didn't give one, I got every single question and they were booing. And I, I have to say, I didn't care. I, I didn't back down one bit. But the, the, I, I said to the Washington Post social media editor, this gets back to the, the manners issue. I said, look, wouldn't it be better if all sites disallowed anonymous commentary, that you can't be anonymous, that you have to sort of be a person exposed? And she said, no, no, no. It is very good that people are able to be themselves without fear. <laughs> I thought, Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that means I can do horrible, horrible things without fear. Nice, nice. So, right. yes, you know, so um, Michael so, Miller from the Acton Institute once said that be yourself is really terrible advice because <laughs> what if you're a jerk? <laughs> you know, that's exactly what you're talking about here. <laughs> what if you're a teenager? Yeah, yeah. You know, no, no. Do not be yourself. Now that's good advice for for, for, for a sixteen year old. It would have been a good advice for me. Again, I'm no I'm no better than I'm, when I was sixteen. I'm no I was no better than I was probably worse than most sixteen year olds are, are today. But yeah, the the online the screen world. I mean, is there any doubt uh, of the damage that the screen world does? I mean, one thing I talk about in the book is the number of Silicon Valley titans who do not let their own kids get on the screen. They've invented these tools for, for our kids. They don't let their own kids get on them. And they, and they used the work of cognitive psychologists who were experts in addiction and attention to help them design these tools. They wanted our kids locked on. And they, and they sent their own kids to the Waldorf school and places like that that are real low, low tech. Steve Jobs famously didn't, didn't let his kids get on the screen so much. But so if they were worried about it. I mean, come on, the rest of us. Yeah, so let, let's think a little bit about maybe some things that are, that are um, going on today that are uh, going against the wind in this respect. So... VMI, of course, is the Virginia Military Institute, and traditionally a conservative, a bastion of conservative sort of uh, sentiment. Um, yeah. Maybe that's not so much the case anymore, but but here it's, even it's woke. The, it's gone woke. Yeah, I'm not surprised. But but uh, you know, if uh, that can happen at a place like VMI, it can happen anywhere. Um, so in terms of uh, some maybe things that are going on that are kind of uh, going against the, the, the tide, um, you know, sort of what, what are some things that maybe you've come across? So for example, uh, my kids uh, were homeschooled and also spent some time in Christian schools and they all love to read. So like my, my second son, uh, he's a, a welder in fact, but he takes Steinbeck uh, for his lunch break. And he's, he's reading, you know, Steinbeck and Dostoevsky, you know, in his free time. Um, and, uh, the same, I, I can say the same for my other kids. So there are kids out there and they're, you know, they're in that millennial category. Uh, but we didn't rely on, you know, public schools or even, uh, you know, boarding schools or anything like that. We, we were pretty involved with the education of our kids throughout. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything like that? Maybe, uh, stuff that you're, in, you know, sort of encouraged about Mark? Well, you know, there is the phenomenon of uh, sometimes the most devout uh, religious groups are those within the most irreligious, secular habitats. Mm -hmm. They they tend to be more more committed because they they they're they're out of the world in a way. What we see now is an explosion taking place in classical education. Mm -hmm. Classical education schools, uh, Protestant, Catholic, charter schools, 
you know, sort of secular, the enrollments are swelling like crazy now mm-hmm. because you've got a lot of parents, I think, who are fleeing the public schools because the race ideology going on there, the sexualization right. of children as we go down lower and lower on the age ladder. But also I think they see the culture very much the, the TikTok culture right. that swarms around kids, you know, seven, eight, nine years old at this point. And they know that we need to get into an institution that is so contrary to all of this. And they're finding it in these classical schools, again, that are opening. Dozens are opening every every month. They're small, yeah. but mm-hmm. the small ones are growing. Mm-hmm. I was just at a meeting of classical educators in Phoenix uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and this is associated with a, uh, a charter network in Arizona and Texas called the Great Hearts schools. They've got a 15,000 student waiting list. Wow. Uh, they can't meet the demand. You'll find the same thing happening at, 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 at classical schools all over the place. This is a sign of people who, parents who, who understand that the culture of the acculturation of kids through the regular school classrooms and through the screen at every other waking moment of my kids' lives is awful. It is a vulgar, coarse, irreverent, irreligious, uh, consumer-oriented, and often in many ways very aggressive uh, public square or, or screen medium hmm. that they occupy. And, you know, we want to get them into classrooms where they are going to read books. Mm-hmm. And they're going to go back into the ages because we want, we want our kids to, to have that. And when they go enter classrooms at Central Connecticut State, they're going to be the ones who can do the reading. They will be able to answer those questions. And I tell them, look, you guys, you do this. You know, the silver lining here is the worse your peers are, the better you will look to your teachers. Your bosses (laughs) are going to love you. They're going to love you. And, you know, I'd be perfectly happy if my son uh, became uh, a skilled artisan, you know, a welder, electrician, a plumber, as long as he's a guy who also reads books. You know, right, thinks right. about ideas right. and cares about, you know, good art, good literature. And uh, that he, he likes reading. He likes reading, uh, reading the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I'm good with that. I, you know, I, the high achiever academic world to me looks like an unhappy one yeah. these days for, for most most kids in it. And your son also doesn't have student loans, does he? <laughs> well, he went to trade school, but yeah, he doesn't have that kind of stuff hanging over him, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It seems as though uh, these neglected, uh, I guess, uh, dimensions of uh, our culture, meaning uh, classical education, uh, the great works, the great books, but also even uh, sort of in the in the larger economy, those places that are uncool, that are not connected to Silicon Valley or some kind of uh, uh, woke uh, entertainment, uh, you know, venture like Netflix or whatever. Those places uh, are full of opportunity. I've got uh, guys that I know who are, you know, seeing tremendous growth in uncool industries that they, they've they started businesses in. I mean, I've got a friend who's got a $100 million business uh recycling electrical transformers and he has no competition <laughs> that's why, because nobody wants to get into that part of the economy it's just it's like being a garbage you know uh you know collector or something <laughs> no no it, it, these these basic uh fundamental things that we need done nobody wants to do because uh they take all their cues from social media and yeah. you know uh well that i that kind of stuff you know i just paid a plumber $250 an hour 
for, for something. And I didn't schedule him. He scheduled me. So, uh, uh, you know, I can get by there next in, Thursday. <laughs> a friend of mine lives in uh, central Wisconsin. He had a hard time finding any electrician within 60 miles yeah. who would come. And, and the schools in Wisconsin, they're trying to train people. They're trying to get artisan, you know, labor, uh, skilled labor, education going. And the thing is, these kids have grown up. And yeah. Is there any social media that makes out of the life of a plumber mm-hmm. something cool? Right, right. You know, I actually think it can be pretty cool. Oh, Working yeah, yeah, with yeah. your hands to do something with your hands right. is, is a great competence. It gives you strength to mm-hmm. know how to do something with your hands that other, other people can't do. That's... Again, that 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 gives you firmness, right? It solidifies. Yeah, this you. brings. This I mean, brings, I, I I my goal, my, you know, one of my dreams is to is to send you know four millennial guys out on a road trip, and they they get out in, in the middle of nowhere where they have no cell phone service, and then they get a flat tire. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I want to see that. Right. Yeah. Well, this brings to mind Matthew Crawford and his his book Shop Class of Soulcraft, and also all the stuff that Mike Rowe has done, and. And when you yeah. get when you actually sit down with some of these younger guys who, who really don't have any competence uh, in anything except maybe texting, they they really do feel as though they've been shortchanged and they're not really sure where to begin. The whole manosphere uh, phenomenon is, oh, yeah. I think, uh, a reflection of that. You know, we have all of these guys who are just, you know, what does it mean to mean to be a man? And they they go in some crazy directions. Uh but it's a lot largely because they've had so little, um, you know, in terms of practical help earlier in life. And they, and they yeah. find themselves yeah. kind of flailing about. Yeah. Well, you know, the feminism, the patriarchy yeah. argument really did trash men quite a bit. And the thing is that that, that whole argument, it, it has completely collapsed under the force of reality. Women are 60% of college students in America today in four-year colleges. Women have been getting more PhDs than men for about 15 years now. They're, 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 there's only one area, those little STEM areas, not even all the STEM areas, because biology, uh, uh, the medical field yeah. is dominated by women, mm-hmm. dominated by women. You go into a hospital, you count the number of men and women working in, on the floors of, of hospitals, you'll, you'll see that medical school is about 50-50 male-female now. Nursing is about 85% female, uh, of, of course. Uh, vet, veterinarian is heavily female. Public health, heavily female. The prof- more women go to law school now than men go to law school. So, sorry, doesn't fly. The patriarchy stuff and of course, you know, when we look at the number of men who are in the most dangerous, the, the number, the breakdown of dangerous jobs, you know, we know, you know, logger and, and right. garbage man and, and the garbage person, sorry. <laughs> and, and, uh, we, we know how, how that gender breaks down. But yeah, young guys, they've been hearing this for all, all their lives and it's bunk. It's nonsense. And we need to, we need to let them know about uh, the value of uh, being, well, I, I was in Coeur d'Alene lecturing at a, at a two-year college uh, in philosophy uh, group. And some kid catches me before the talk and says, hey, you're the guy who wrote the book, right? The dumbest generation. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was kind of this goth kid, all black <laughs> hair, you know, long black hair. Right, black. Right. And, and I talked to him for a few minutes. He's a double major, philosophy and Automotive upholstery. <laughs> they, had, they had a special program in automotive upholstery. And afterwards, one of the teachers said, Oh, yeah, you met that kid. Let me tell you, he is an artist in a car and he's on his way. I asked the kid, Well, what's the job market like for that? And he said, Well, I'm already doing part time work. And, and believe me, people who, you know, you go to those auto auction shows. That upholstery stuff, that's art. That really is oh, yeah, yeah. A, 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 an incredible skill. He said in, in Idaho, Coeur d'Alene 
I can work two weeks on and then take two weeks off. Mm -hmm. And I make $55,000 a year. Mm -hmm. This is right out of, right out a two year college degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he has no debt. Right. And, and he, he can work half the year and he's making 55 grand in a pretty low cost area mm -hmm. to yeah, live. I yeah, I know that area. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but, but the point is he reads philosophy yep. and his work, you know, he, he, he really is uh, a, a craftsman mm -hmm. yeah. in, in his job. This is what his teachers uh, told me. Yeah, I believe it. Well, and I, I guess uh, the thing that, uh, that I'd uh, you know, like to direct some of our listeners to is just what you just described there, Mark, that it is possible. In fact, it's the ideal, I think, to be able to uh, span those worlds, sort of have a foot in each, um, being able to you know, yeah. know, enjoy the great books, under, you know, read them and uh, get a lot out of them, and then also do something with your hands as practical. If, you, if, you, if you're able to do that, you're pretty much the master of the universe. <laughs> Anywhere you go, you're comfortable. And, uh, yeah. you know, you, whether and, you're talking to blue collar guys or up, up uh, college guys. And people want you. They need you. We yeah. need welders. We need yeah. electricians. It's good to be wanted. I mean, I, I was, uh, I got lucky. I got a job as an English professor. There are 10 times as many English professors as there are good jobs for them. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we don't feel wanted. Uh, we, 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 uh, uh, my English professor colleagues, we have felt generally underappreciated. Uh, but you know, when you, uh, when you're in demand, it's a nice feeling. Yeah. So, uh, so are there, are there, are there any things about, uh, this new book or even the, the, the last book that you want to make sure we had, we get to in terms of, uh, you know, thinking about the situation we find ourselves in today that we haven't gotten to yet in our, in our conversation? Well, just to identify how important it is that during these teenage years that students get the exposure, young people get the exposure to good music, to good books, to good art, that they learn history. You got to know what happened in the French Revolution. You got to know that. You got to have some idea about what people endured at Shiloh and Antietam. So, and, and you have to, you, you've got to read some of the Proverbs every night, you know, so they're going to have their youth culture. Okay. Okay. But yeah. you must insert into their lives, adult culture, mature stuff, give them civilization, let them feel yeah. that they stand in the shadow of greatness and brilliance and transcendence and sublimity and, and beauty. Let them know this. And it's, it's, they're older now, they can still learn this. So, you know, if I had final words to your viewers, I would say, find a millennial, find, find a, uh, uh, a miserable millennial <laughs> and let him know that there are better things uh, with which to spend his leisure time. Right. And that these things are, are going to make his life a little more meaningful. It won't make him happy. I don't guarantee that. But he <laughs> might become a little less bitter. <laughs> He'll have more understanding. Right, right, right. And there is, there's a satisfaction in, in understanding what, right. what you're undergoing. So, you know, you feel disappointed at work. Well, yeah, yeah, go read, watch Death of a Salesman. Okay. Right. Yeah, right, yeah. There's middle aged disappointment. To play. <laughs> uh, the girl, you know, the woman, the woman you loved, you still think about her. You know, read The Great Gatsby. You know, yeah. a guy trying to recreate the past with his lost love. Just, <laughs> just get these things in inside your 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 heart. Uh, yeah. And you know, you feel like you you know you've screwed up. You know, a few years. Read read about the prodigal son. Right. <laughs> so these these are the things that I would urge to, to come out of this book to try to rescue some of these wayward souls right. uh, who don't, they, they're not even, they're not getting married. They're not thinking of having kids. You know, they, they don't have any plan for, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be in your forties. What then? 
<laughs> give them give them some some role models give them give them some art and give them some transcendence that that's that's my 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 message that's a good message so before we kind of wrap up and before we're done i'd like to talk to you a little bit about ways that people can buy the books and maybe follow your writing and so forth but glenn is there anything you wanted to say before we wrap up um I, yeah, I think, you know, as I said the before, I think the situation is actually pretty dire when you get past the millennials. Um, when you think about it, some of the employed millennials are the teachers of the kids I'm teaching or I was teaching at the university. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the there's a reason why the classics became classics. There was a lot of schlock written in the past. That's right. That's right. It but, wasn't. It wasn't all great. <laughs> right. But the the things that survived survived for a reason, and there is a reason why Shakespeare, for example, is read and appreciated and translated into every language and every culture around the world. Yeah. There, there's a reason for that, and somehow we seem to have forgotten that. And we, we really need to, th this needs to change or, well, I don't even like to think of what the alternative is. Hmm. Tom, any thoughts? Well, I think one of the things that came to mind is something I, I think from my own upbringing, I, I had a, a Finnish grandmother who um, came from a big family. Her father died young. They couldn't, uh, her mother couldn't even speak English in, in, in America, but, um, she went to work in these very wealthy homes and she fell in love with the high culture, the art, the classical music, the cooking. And she brought that into her home and she brought it into my mom's world and, and it infected us to the point that I could really say what drove my love for those things was the aesthetic she created from seeing the value of that and, and wanting to hand that on. And I often think of the ways in which we live our life and, and, and kind of create a world in which, you know, there is classical and there is jazz and we have these books around because I do think that is one way of at least shaping our children when we may not be able to quite put it in their hand all the time. So that just came to mind when we were talking about these things. Well, I think that's a great thought, uh, Tom. I think uh, there's a sense that uh, in in a kind of uh, high culture, but properly understood, there's a kind of trickle down. There's in a, in a, in a positive sense in which uh, some of the some of these uh, really praiseworthy uh, works uh, become uh, objects of of interest for people who don't yeah. belong to you know, uh, the elites in our society, but, yeah. uh, because of that high regard, they, they say, what, well, there must be something to this stuff. And, and then they're introduced to it. Yeah. Uh, and the next thing you know, you know, they're, uh, they're reading Shakespeare on lunch breaks. That's right. <laughs> and, that, and that's what we, that's what, that's what we want to see. So anyways, Mark, uh, you, as, as we're wrapping up, uh, how would people, uh, you know, find you online, uh, Maybe you can say something about First Things, which is a which is a journal that we love and have talked about before. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Anything you want to uh, help us to to see before you you, you have to sign off? Uh, First Things Magazine, where I, I work, is a monthly magazine. Uh, religion, culture, some politics, but we try not to get caught up in the news cycle too much. Uh, much Catholic, but also Protestant, uh, some Jewish, and we try again to give clarity on some of the deeper issues, the, the deeper undercurrents of what is going on in, in our country today. The book is, of course, Leviathan has it, as it has everything, Amazon, and they have a nice discount, and Barnes & Noble. You can get it in the front of the Barnes & Noble store. It's under the new nonfiction. Uh, one thing, you know, I'll say this about Amazon. You can go to Amazon, click on a book, and you can go, other copies, this new and used, you click on that and you'll find a list of sellers, non-Amazon sellers come up and many of them list the book as new. And many of these are independent bookstores selling books through Amazon. Amazon gets a little cut, not very much, 
but this is a way of supporting your independent bookseller. I use them all the time. I never buy on Amazon. I buy books through Amazon, but not on Amazon. Gotcha. I'll go through another seller because this is in this in, in line. We want to support the little guy, right? We want to keep the neighborhood shop uh, open, the, the mom and pop businesses. I'm very big on, on staying away from the giants mm -hmm. uh, in all things. Right, right, <laughs> so right, most right. things, I should say, <laughs> uh, when, when I can. Yeah. Um, but so that, that, that's the, that's the way to go. Great. Great. I'm getting the book. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on uh, our show here today, Mark. It's been great to see you again. And, uh, and I, I think that, uh, the things that you've just noted, you know, the book, obviously, and first things, first things is great. We, one of our friends is a guy named Aaron Wren and Aaron just recently had a cover story, uh, there on the three worlds of evangelicalism. And we talked to him about that, but we talk about first things fairly regularly. Uh, here and it'd really be, be great to see a lot of our listeners uh, subscribe it's, it's really a, a very worthwhile publication wonderful and, uh, anyway but uh, again thanks for thanks for being with us and and those of you who are listening out there in podcast land thank you for listening we know that we've got listeners around the world and and people download the show every week and we're, we're very grateful when people actually give us nice ratings most of the time <laughs> occasionally not but uh, <laughs> but anyway we, we do appreciate that and, and even the financial support so thanks a lot again and bye-bye